You are listening to The Underground Subway with host David Alston, a podcast dedicated to giving you the strategies to live a free and better life. Here is David Alston. Hi, I'm David Alston and welcome to The Underground Subway, a podcast that is dedicated to one thing that is giving you, my friend, the tools, the strategies, the ideas and concepts necessary for you to live a free and better life. No matter where you are, no matter what you've gone through, no matter what the situation, the Underground Subway is here to lend a helping hand to tell you that your days of being in bondage, your days of being tied up. What do I mean by that? Well, if I want you to live a life that is free from chains and bondage, if I want you to live a life of liberty, liberty means being able to function, to act, to speak, to react, to move, to live life without restraints. Many of us have restraints that we don't even know that we have. My grandmother's first cousin was Harriet Tubman and Harriet Tubman said this, I could have freed a lot more people if only they knew there were slaves. What that means to me is that we ourselves oftentimes live a life in which we have things holding us back and we have no idea that we're being held back. Well, this podcast is dedicated to revealing the chains, showing you what is holding us back, and then giving you the strategies to become free and liberated. Not just you. No one wants to be free and have their children left behind in bondage. No, we're coming out, the children, the grandchildren, my neighbors, the dog, the cat, the goldfish, all of us are coming out free. Listen, my friends, I am super excited Super excited. I mean, super excited to have my guests with us for this edition of the Underground Subway because I'm dedicated to giving you two types of guests. Those I'm dedicated to giving you guests of quality and those that are qualified. And my guest for this edition of the Underground Subway is certainly quality and she is qualified. Let me tell you about our guest. Her name is Robin Stacks. And let me tell you a little bit about Robin. Robin is a confidence coach. She's a professional speaker, author, and motivator. Personally, she is a mom, a wife, and a friend. Robin has facilitated personal and professional development workshops internationally for companies including Microsoft, Panera, and American Greetings. Her professional experience includes being on air and on air talent for NBC, ABC network affiliates. She's an award-winning journalist herself. She has also trained Emmy Award nominees and an Emmy Award winner. Coaching clients ranging from young athletes to Fortune 500 executives. Her book, which is entitled Get Off My Bus, How to Get Clarity, Get in the Driver's Seat, and Get Moving in Your Life, was nominated for Small Business Trends, Small Business Book of 2010 and it's available at all the usual suspects, including Amazon and Barnes and Noble. My friends, I want you to join me as we welcome to the underground subway, Robin Sachs. Robin, thank you so much for joining the underground subway. Oh, Dave, thanks so much, David, for the for the uh, lovely introduction and also for the invite to share with your audience. Well, I'm looking forward you. to sharing some great things with them. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's jump right into it. I want to give you all the time that you need because I'm excited about reading about your history and about and your bio. And I want to just jump right into it because one of the key parts of your bio, you are referred to as a confidence coach. So talk to us, Robin, about one of the things that I always do with all of my guests is I share with them that I'm from Philadelphia. Although I currently live in North Carolina, I'm from Philadelphia. And the movie Philadelphia is one of my favorite movies. It stars Tom Hanks and Denzel Washington. And in the movie, Denzel is an attorney and he speaks to a witness and he asks the witness a question. And then he says, now, the question I'm asking you is so simple and is really going to blow the case. So explain it to me like I'm a six year old. So, Robin, explain to us like we are six year olds. If you're the confidence coach, what is confidence? All right. What, what would that be? First graders, second graders? Here, here's what you need to know about confidence. Confident people are not in control of the situation all the time. Good luck with that. 
Confident people are not in control of other people. Good luck with that. Confident people are in control of themselves. No matter who's in the room, no matter what is going on, no matter what the situation is. And so one of the main things as human beings we struggle with is we're often looking for how to be more confident outside of ourselves. And the answers are all inside. And so once you start to realize that when you learn the skills, and they are skills, confidence is a skill. Like any other skill, it can be learned. When you learn the skill of confidence, you realize how much more control you have. And you then are able to show up in situations the way you want to show up, where you are calm, because calm is a superpower, and we can talk more about that, and, and relaxed, because everything can be done better when we're relaxed. So confidence is simply about being in control of you. So there, there's my, my second grade, six-year-old version of that. How was that? That was perfect. That was perfect. Well, Robert, you talked about feeling confident. What actually happens? Are there things that happen to us in our life? If you want to give us some examples, whether from your past or from your professional viewpoint, are there things that happen in our lives that can affect or get in the way of our feeling confident? Certainly, certainly. And you know, the, the, there's a spectrum. It runs the gamut. Um, you know, there there are, of course, traumatic experiences that impact or affect our confidence for years. Um, and those are things that I will say right off the bat are beyond my scope of expertise. So the, the things that impact our confidence that, that I'd love to, to do a deeper dive with us here today is, you know, the, probably the biggest thing that impacts most people's confidence has to do with their own self-talk. Okay. And okay. it's fascinating. If, if you stop and really think about it, um, there are sometimes things that were said to us once and we latched on to those mentally. And for the last 10 years, we've said those things to ourselves. Mm. There are times where um, we're actually good at something or we're doing something well, and even somebody might give us a compliment. You know, you're really good at that, or you did a great job. And instead of going, thank you, and owning the fact that we did that, our immediate response is, no, well, it wasn't a big deal. No, I'm not that good. And we immediately kind of push ourselves back down, even when other people see our value. There are times when it could be a very simple thing where we stop ourselves in our tracks because we have a moment of what I call the yes moment, right? We get excited about something. We could do this. And then we immediately start thinking of all the things that won't work. And our self-talk starts to kick in and it is often very negative. It is often very critical. And it is often, it, it can cross lines sometimes and really become a bully in our own head. And so that inner bully, and, and, and it's often on autopilot. We don't even really realize it until somebody says, hey, do you realize you do this? And it can stop you in your tracks. Whereas if we learn to shift our self-talk a little bit, you now can be your biggest supporter, your biggest proponent. You can be a coach who's got your back as opposed to a critical negative bully with yourself. And that all is happening in our own heads. And so probably the biggest thing I see uh, in, in working with people of all ages, and, and it's amazing because it young, old, male, female, um, all different positions, you could be an entry-level sales kid somewhere, you could be the CEO somewhere. It doesn't matter. Every human being has that self-talk voice. Mm -hmm. And most people don't even realize sometimes how negative and critical that voice is and how much it takes a hit at your confidence and that you can shift it mm -hmm. and really change how you show up and how you feel about yourself in any given moment. Wow. I'm, I'm just smiling because um, I want to say that it doesn't, I don't, I don't think that it applies just to a broad spectrum of life, but 
little things such as I was smiling because as you were talking, I remember when I play golf, oftentimes when I show up and I'm confident, oh, I know I'm just going to hit this shot. I have a perfect game. But the moment I start thinking, I'm really been hitting too many good shots that's going to, you know, or a friend say, wow, that was a good shot. And I'm thinking it's saying to him, no, nah, it really wasn't that. And, <laughs> and oftentimes what happens is I'll stand over a shot and I'll begin to talk. You talk about that self talk. I will say to myself, you know what? If I don't hit this shot perfectly, life goes on. It's no big deal. Mm -hmm. I put pressure on myself. I'm not playing for money. There are no cameras. So, so that's true. That's true. I mean, I'm just, I'm in awe so far. Okay, Rob. Well, you know, we talk about that, that self-talk and, and how, what I did personally, how can we learn to shift that self-talk or whether it's our body language or like my golf game, how I'm thinking mentally to, to exude more confidence? How do we do that? I just happen to do it on the golf course, but what about in life? What can we do in life to make that shift? So let me, I'll, I'll give you a couple of, of tools and tips that anybody can grab onto and immediately start using in their life. Because, you know, it, the, the main thing to know about the self-talk, here's at the very foundation, two things to know. One, we go where our attention goes. So if I'm focused on, and, and I'll use David, your example, if the, you know, I step up to the tee box on the golf course. And or I step up to the plate at a baseball game, right? Whatever it is I'm doing in life, I, I get up in front of the group to, to speak, right? Whatever it is, it's all exactly the same thing. The mm -hmm. first thing is I'm going to go where my attention goes. So if I step up to the plate, so to speak, and in my head, I'm thinking, don't strike out, don't strike out, don't strike out. What am I going to most likely do? You're going to strike out. Of course, because our brains do not recognize the word don't. It's the same thing if I'm going to get up to public speak in front of the group and I, I, I'm nervous if I'm public speaking in my head, right? People, are, I might be thinking, don't be nervous. Don't be nervous. Don't mess up. Don't screw up. Right? We're, we say those things. We're always focused. Isn't it interesting to think about on the thing we don't want? Wow. And because our subconscious brain does not recognize the word don't, what we're saying to ourselves is, you're probably going to strike out. You're probably going to strike out. You're nervous. You're nervous. You're nervous. And what our brains do is latch on to those, those words and go, oh, I know how to do nervous. And what it does is it instantly starts that whole fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. And within moments, we create that negative situation. Wow. So the first thing is focusing on what you do want as opposed to what you don't want, because you will always go where your attention goes. So if I'm to your point, if I step up, you know, to, to the tee on the golf course and I'm thinking, oh, boy, I'm, I'm probably going to slice this like crazy because I, I've hit too many good shots in a row or, oh, I'm just not feeling it today. Or, uh oh, so-and-so is watching. I need to be impressive. Whatever it might be. You've been following if I'm, me, haven't you? Yeah, you've been, the ball's you've going been in following the woods. me play, haven't you? <laughs> <'Cause you're laughs> right? The ball's going in the woods. It's right. going in the sand trap. It's going in the water. Just guarantee it. If I walk up and I say, go back to basics, see ball, hit ball, and I swing mm -hmm. and I watch the ball hit the club, I'm going to be perfectly in the middle of the fairway every single time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if if I'm got to if I've got to get up and speak and I'm nervous, instead of saying I'm nervous, don't be nervous. What's the opposite of that? Okay, sit back and take a couple of breaths. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be calm. I'm going to breathe. Right. You start to focus on the things that serve you instead of the things that don't. So when we focus on things that don't we don't want to happen. What happens again is our brain goes, oh, okay, I can do that. And it starts to kick in, like I said, that fight or flight response. And, and what happens very quickly is our brain goes, uh-oh, danger. You're nervous. Oh, no. And it all of a sudden says, hey, adrenaline, hey, cortisol, start shooting out and 
running through your body. Quick, get those chemicals and hormones shooting through your body. We're in danger here. We've got trouble. We're nervous. We're anxious. We're overwhelmed. We're stressed. We're fearful. Whatever the feeling is in that moment that my brain just created by going, "Uh oh, I'm nervous. Uh oh, this won't work. Mm -hmm. What happens is your breathing gets high and shallow, right? All of your blood rushes from your vital organs out to your extremities because you've got to get ready to fight or run, right? That's, that's all that your brain is doing right then. It hijacks your body and it literally puts you in survival mode. Now, we've had that since caveman days, that response, and we still have it today because should there be a true threat to our safety, we want that kicking in, right? Heaven forbid the house is on fire and I got to run in and try and get somebody out. You don't think, right? Logical thinking goes away. You go and you take action. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite quotes is the hero and the coward feel the same fear. The only difference is one chooses to take action. Mm-hmm. So that feeling, if we're in fight or flight, the feeling is making our choices, our decisions, and that doesn't serve us. When I focus on what I do want, what I do is I'm, I'm teaching my brain, I'm telling my brain, hey, we need to sit back and take a couple of breaths. And be calm because I know what I'm talking about and we're going to share when I get up in front of the group or I've hit this ball on the fairway a hundred times and all I have to remember is the basics. See, ball, hit, ball and swing. Stop thinking about things. What happens is your brain goes, oh, I know how to do that. Yeah, we're fine. And it doesn't create that fight or flight mode. So the idea here is if we know When what we focus on determines what happens mentally and physically in our body, because our our psychology and our our physiology are interconnected, when you think something, you're going to feel an emotion, and that emotion is going to create a behavior. So it's all interconnected. So a couple of ways to get in a habit of quickly being able to shift that and really teaching yourself how to focus on what you want. And here here are two ways to do that. One, the interesting part of this is we all do this super well with other people (laughs) because we we always know what everyone else needs to be doing, right? It's easy to fix everyone else. When we look in the mirror, we're in a total loss. So (laughs) the first thing is begin to talk to yourself like you would talk to a friend. Okay. That is huge with self-talk because if you think about it, Let's say, let's say I am getting up to speak to a group about something, but I'm really nervous, right? I might be saying, you know, oh my goodness, I, I, oh, I don't like speaking like this. I don't like everybody's eyes on me. It makes me nervous. I, you know, I don't, I tried to memorize stuff, but what if I mess up? What are they going to think of me? They're all judging me. You know, all of those things that oftentimes people think, and, you know, I'm going to mess this up. And we say those things to ourselves. We think, self-talk those things to ourselves. But if a friend was telling that same thing to you, we would never go, yeah, you're going to completely blow this. You're awful. (laughs) We would never say that to them, would we? We would instead encourage them. We would build them up. We'd say, hey, stop that. You are really good at what you do. You've got a great piece of information or a story to share. You do this all the time and you always talk yourself down like you're going to mess up. You go in and you do fine. That's why you just got the promotion. That's why they asked you to come in and share. Stop that. Get in there and go knock it out of the park, right? Right. That's how we talk to other people. So tool number one, tip number one, begin to talk to yourself in your own head like you would a friend. Now, Tip two is an easy way to get used to doing that because one is just start to think about that and remind yourself, what would you say to someone else saying the same thing that you're saying? Mm -hmm. Another way to do this is give that negative self-talk voice a name. So for example, let's say I'm going to call my negative self-talk voice Bob. When that voice starts chirping, which it is going to do, right? Oh, you don't, you didn't have enough time to prepare, you know, oh, you've messed up the last three shots. Oh, you're in a slump. You know, you got to get up and try again. I don't think it's going to go very well. 
I can now stop. I can say, Bob, I disagree with you. Or Bob, go sit down in the corner. We'll talk about this later. I have stuff to do right now. I can start to talk back to Bob because by naming that self-talk voice, it not only separates it from my own. And, and if anyone else ever said to us what we say to ourselves, there'd probably be a fight. Right. Because when we hear someone else saying it to us, eh, no, but we'll criticize ourselves all day. Mm-hmm. But other people can't say those things to us, right? So it separates that negative self-talk, that critical voice from our own. And two, for a lot of people, it gives you the opportunity, maybe for the very first time ever, to start standing up for yourself in your own head. And that is a really, really powerful thing. Because now you can validate or invalidate that voice. If it's valid, you can say, Bob, you've got a great point. We're in a slump, but we're working on getting out of it. Here's what we're going to do. Bob's going to start to get real quiet because you just kind of put Bob to the side. Right. Or if Bob says, oh, this is all you're going to be bad at this. And it's something I'm not bad at. I don't have to believe everything I think. I can say, Bob, you're completely wrong. We just did this three times beautifully. So stop lying to me. I'm not listening to you anymore because you just lied to me. So those are a couple of ways to really start to shift your self-talk voice um, that will have immediate results because when we've got the negative critical voice, it's constantly poking at our self-esteem. When we start to step back and talk to ourselves differently and stand up for ourselves differently and tell that self-talk voice, you're wrong, go sit down, I'm busy, all of a sudden our confidence starts to go up. And if you think about it, if you think about like a a, a child's seesaw on a playground, Mm -hmm. one side is stress and anxiety and one side is confidence. What, What typically happens is When your stress levels go up, it tilts and your your confidence goes down. By the same rule, when your confidence starts to go up, your stress and anxiety level goes down. So by managing the stress differently, you can lower it and that naturally raises your confidence. By the same token, if you do things that help you to feel a little more confident, the stress level naturally goes down. So there are two ways, if you think of the seesaw, to feel less stress and more confidence when you need to or want to. And the more you do that, the more it becomes a habit and it just starts to become how you think and how you show up over time. Wow. This is good. I'm really enjoying this. I've got a million notes that I'm taking now. Let's talk about Mm -hmm. something that you mentioned earlier. You mentioned this word and you said, we'll talk about this later. Let's talk about it. Because I want to know, I'm wondering, uh, are there any benefits or what are the benefits? I'm sure there are, but what are the benefits for us to live a life in which we're feeling like I'm more in control, I have more confidence? And and this word that you mentioned earlier, calm. Talk to us about that. So calm is truly a superpower. It is truly a superpower. And you know, when we talk about, if you, if you really think about it, when we talk about things like confidence or like stress management or reducing anxiety or, you know, learning how to stop overthinking, right? All of those types of things. There are, there are dozens of things we try and do, how to manage our time, right? All of these things, it's fascinating when you think about it, the core of all of them is we're kind of seeking more calm. We want to be in a place where we're not feeling like we're being pulled in a bunch of different directions or like I have a meeting after a meeting after a meeting after a meeting and I literally, I wake up and start the day and I don't stop, right? That's what we talk about for time management. How do I regain control of my time? When we talk about stress, anxiety, overwhelm, fear, all of those types of things, we're talking about how do I regain control over my feelings? or emotions. And so the the thing to know is at the very core, everything can be done better when we're relaxed. 
And so, you know, I talked about that fight or flight response. When we kick into fight or flight, either because we did or said something for ourselves, right? Negative self-talk can kick us into fight or flight and really have us revved up. Someone can say or do something that, that sort of takes a knock at our self-esteem and quickly we can go into fight or flight. Um, because our brains can't always tell the difference between a threat to our safety and a threat to our self-esteem, which is why we often get kicked into fight or flight on a pretty consistent basis. So the way out of that or the path out of that is to regain control of you. And the way that you regain control of you is completely centered in calm. It's centered in things like the breath, and we'll talk about that in a minute, David. I'll give you, I'll give your your listeners some tips. How do you do that in the moment, and how do you practice it so that it becomes a habit when it's where it's always with you? You don't even have to call upon it; it's just there for you. Um, the breath is a huge piece of calm. Uh, body language and muscle tension is a huge piece of calm as well, because when we get tense, that tension physically goes somewhere in our bodies. So, for example, if you think of, of where most people carry tension, um, some people carry it in their knees and they lock their knees. Some people carry it in their shoulders and their shoulders literally go up, right? Some people carry it in their neck and their, their chin is either up or down, depending on where that tension is. Some people carry it in their jaws. And they, they grind their teeth or they, they, you know, there are TMJ issues and stuff because my teeth are constantly tight. Those muscles are all so tight because the tension is there. So muscle, the, the release of muscle tension is key to being more relaxed and being calm. And again, what's important about that is the more calm you are, the more relaxed you are, the more in control of you, you can be. And that again is, is the key to this. Breathing, same sort of thing. You know, when, when someone else is, is really stressed out about something, what's the first thing we tell them to do? Take a breath, breathe. <laughs> take a breath, right? All right, take a couple of deep breaths. Okay, now tell me what's going on. So again, we know how to help other people, what the advice we can give in the moment, but we don't give that same advice to ourselves. When we're really stressed or anxious or overwhelmed, the last thing we say to ourselves is, okay, stop, take a couple of deep breaths. We don't, we just don't do it because we're in fight or flight. We're not in a place of choice in that moment. So breathing is so key. It, it sounds ridiculous because of course breathing is key. <laughs> we all do it 24 seven, every moment of our lives, but there are ways you can use the breath and breathe that actually promote relaxation. And there are ways we breathe that promote stress. So I'll give you an example. And this is something everybody listening can try right now, okay? If, if you're sitting down, or even if you're standing, if you're standing, just get still for a moment, get on, you know, balance weight on both feet, just get nice and grounded. If you're sitting, go ahead and sit back so that your back's against the chair, your tailbone's against the chair, and literally let the chair do all the work. Because if we're not on the chair, we're up. And if you're sitting, go ahead and move up. And you can feel the tension. In order to sit up away from the chair, I have to create tension in my body, in my lower back, my hips, my shoulders. I have to carry everything forward. So I'm creating tension, which if I sit this way for 5, 10, 15 minutes, my brain's going to start going, why are we tense? Danger. And it's going to start kicking in all of those little fight or flight pieces. By simply sitting back, let the chair do all the work, it literally releases a bunch of that tension. You can feel that, which is amazing. So if you sit back for a moment, and if I say, now go ahead and everybody take a big breath. <sighs> Chances are you all inhale. And your upper body expanded, your shoulders went way up. <sighs> Here's the thing. We just all, if that's what you did, which is what most people will do, you just took a fight or flight breath. 
everything is up at our chest. It's all chest breathing. Chances are you didn't get any breath down lower towards your belly, right? What we call a belly breath. That's why we say to people, hey, take a deep breath. Take a couple deep breaths. The key there is deep. So I'm going to ask you to do that breath a different way. And I want, I want everyone to see if they notice a difference. So instead of going, <sighs> we're not going to inhale, exhale. We're going to reverse that. And we're going to start with the exhale. So give this a try. Sitting back, go ahead and exhale all of your air. Just push it all out until you cannot push any more out. Push it all the way out. And then just let the breath come back in naturally on the inhale and see if you notice it come into a different area of your torso, not just your upper body. See if you can feel that breath come in a little bit lower. David, did you notice any difference? I did. I noticed that it was almost like the entire, my entire upper body was receiving all that air. Okay, nice, nice. So the interesting thing, and, and if, if any of your listeners, if you've ever done meditation or yoga or, or tai chi or, or any type of martial arts, it's very focused on the breath and the core, right? And the core, if you think about the core of your body, it's kind of your belly, your diaphragmatic area there, mm -hmm. your, your abdomen, right? That's your core. And the reason why so much is centered there is your core is your place of, of personal power. Mm -hmm. When you come from your core, whether it's breathing, if we breathe from our diaphragm, from our belly, we're naturally calming. We're actually massaging all of the vital organs, which keeps blood flow and circulation going. It's, it's amazing if, if you want to deep dive into just breath and what deep breaths do for your body physiologically, it's absolutely fascinating, um, truly from a medical standpoint. Uh, for our purposes here, though, we don't need to go that deep. What we need to know is sitting back and starting with an exhale and then letting my breath come in. So I'm exhaling and inhaling. If I begin to breathe in that way, research tells us five of those breaths can reset your physiology. It's, it's like rebooting a computer. If you're on your computer and it's glitching and it keeps freezing and eventually you just turn it off and you turn it back on, what happens? It's usually perfectly fine, right? Right. You cleared the cache. It's like nothing happened. It works perfectly fine. So if you think about our bodies and brains, we're just machines as human beings. And what we put in, whether it's mentally, physically, what we put into our bodies determine if it's going to work well or not, right? It's like putting gas in your car. If you don't have fuel in your tank, it's not going to drive. You're going to stop, right? If I don't change the oil occasionally, mm -hmm. right, or change a filter yeah. here and there, I, it's not going to run effectively. And so the breath is pretty much fuel for your, for your body, for your car of a body. So one of the simplest ways to regain control in the moment is to truly sit back, mm -hmm. take a breath, exhaling first, inhaling, and taking a few of those types of breath. So all we're really doing, David, if you think about it, because you're still breathing with an inhale and an exhale. Mm -hmm. It's just instead of in our minds thinking inhale, exhale, we're reversing it. And we're saying to ourselves, exhale, inhale. The difference that that makes is huge. It's a little thing that makes a huge difference because when we inhale first, it's all going to end up in our chest area, the top third of our lungs. When we exhale first and inhale, it almost feels as if your lungs are filling from the bottom up and you end up getting more air, more oxygen. And what happens is you oxygenate your blood more because you're bringing more in. And all of a sudden your brain goes, ah, we got this. We're good. No danger. And it keeps all of those other fight or flight things out of the mix. Doing that can keep us in control of us. Same thing with the physical stuff, the body language. If you start to notice the way that you sit 
or stand at any given moment, just start to become aware if you're sitting or standing in a way that's creating tension. So for example, uh, you know, if I cross my arms, you know, if everybody goes ahead and crosses their arms, in order to do that, you have to create tension in your shoulders mm-hmm. and your and your biceps. You can't cross your arms without doing that. So after you sit like this for a few minutes, even though it's just comfortable, your brain starts to go, why are we tense? What's wrong? And it starts to move those little adrenaline troops, right? Closer to being released because it's getting you ready for fight or flight and all of those things that come along. Um, you know, if I stand and I, my hip is shifted, so one of my knees is locked, right? At some point, my brain's going to go, you got to move. We've got to start circulation again. And I'm going to go to the other knee probably because I'm anytime we're tense, our muscles tense up and we actually start to restrict blood flow, which again, throws our brain into what's wrong, fight or flight. Wow. And all of those wow. things start. So it's fascinating when you really stop to think about something as simple as, Sitting back at the chair, let the chair do all the work, releases tension and can keep you out of fight or flight. If I'm standing, if I just get grounded on both feet, like I'm rooted like a tree and I feel that, not only do I feel confident, because when you open up and just ground and center yourself, whether you're in a chair or standing, you instantly also feel more confident and your brain supports that because your brain says, hey, we're okay. Nothing's wrong right now. So in those moments to just kind of wrap that up real quickly, when you're feeling stressed, anxious, tense, overwhelmed, fearful, any of those type of feelings, take a second, sit back, take a couple of those breaths like we talked about, and just allow your body and brain to do their magic and put you in a place of calm so that you can be in control of you in that moment, because that's your superpower. Wow. Robin, I want to thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate you. The, the information has been priceless. As the, there's an old saying that says time flies when you're having fun and we're running out of time. <laughs> but I certainly want to thank you for joining us. And hopefully we can come back and do this again sometime. Well, thank you again for the invite, David, and any time. All right. To our listeners, we're Hearing the music, which means the train is pulling into the into the stop area. You're going to have to get off of the underground subway. But fortunately, we'll be back another time with another episode. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to listen to the underground subway. And I'm sure that you have gained some information to help you become a better person. Well, we've got to go. We'll see you next time on the underground subway. But before you go, I want to challenge you tonight before you go to bed. Find a mirror, look yourself in the eye and ask yourself today, did I do something to make this world a better place? Did I make do something to work toward my purpose in life? Or did I simply waste another day? Hmm, Think about that. No more time to waste. We'll see you next time on the Underground Subway.